Well, Brother, uh, Brother Dion went to the same Bible college I went to, but that doesn't make him a totally bad guy. <laughs> it's supposed to be a joke. You guys don't ever laugh. When I, when I mess up and didn't mean to, then you laugh at me. Uh, but I, I appreciate uh, Windsor Hills Baptist Church and the college there. And, and uh, one thing that uh, Oklahoma Baptist College has done very well is turned out uh, missionaries. And uh, they turned out missionaries uh, who have spanned the globe. And they turned out missionaries who know how to work and have burden for souls. And Brother Dion and his wife have a burden for souls. And I mean, why else would anybody want to give up a life of ease here in the United States and go to a third world country and live among people that they don't understand their culture quite as well and give up the comforts of home but they love souls and they love the Lord. Brother Dion, come and preach for us would you brother? I think so. It's good to be back here in the States. And if uh, anybody has any complaints about the cold weather, we prayed for it. After being in the jungle for as many years as we've been, you enjoy cold weather. I tell folks, the Filipinos will ask us, what's it like, this cold weather snow? And I open the freezer and I say, that's what it's like. But it's all over the place, amen? And so if I want cold weather, I open up the freezer. That's cold weather. When a storm goes through, it gets down in the 60s. And we are so cold when it's in the 60s. We've been there 20 some odd years off and on. And we've uh, been up in Kazan City area. We've been in Samar, which is the area that got hit. One of the areas that got hit and we're concerned. We haven't heard from our people yet over there. And uh, the area that we're at, it, was, it, it got a lot of rain, but there was no bad uh, d uh, destruction there. And so we were glad for that. But we're concerned about the other areas. And so you pray with us um, as we want to hear how the mission works are doing and, and make sure everybody is okay over there. We understand the road finally was opened up so they could start getting supplies in. But... Uh, we haven't heard how the works are. So you pray with us about our mission works that were over in the area like that. And uh, we'll be back Sunday and hopefully we'll have some news about what's going on over there. This is my wife Beth. We've uh, been married 44 years. Been missionaries 24 years. And our kids, they were raised on the mission field. They not only speak what I what I, they think in what I what I. And there's so often my my son would turn to me years ago and say, Dad, how do you say that in English? And I said, What are you doing? Thinking in what I what I? He says, Yes. Well now we're back in a different language, we're having to learn Sabuano. And at sixty five years old, learning a new language is not easy. I had a rough time at the younger languages, at uh, younger years, but uh, now at 65 it's, it's almost impossible, but you know what? There's nothing impossible with God, amen? Nothing impossible with God. So I'll look forward to uh, giving you more of a rundown and everything, what's happening on Sunday night, okay? So if you would please, turn in your Bibles to Luke chapter 5. Luke chapter 5, and what I want to do is tonight is um, give something that is missions, really it is, because see, God wants every one of us to be doing something, and so what I've entitled this is, after meeting the Savior, now what? What is God's ex expectation for each one of us now that we have received Christ as our Savior. So let's go ahead and read Luke chapter 5, start in verse 1. And it came to pass that as the people 
pressed upon him to hear the word of God, he stood by the lake of Gennesaret and saw two ships standing by the lake, but the fishermen were going out of them and were washing their nets. And he entered into one of the ships, which was Simon's, and prayed him that he would thrust out a little from the land. And he sat down and taught the people out of the ship. Now when he had left speaking, he said unto Simon, Launch out in the deep, and let down your nets for a drought. And Simon answered and said unto him, Master, we have toiled all the night, and have taken nothing. Nevertheless, at thy word I will let down the net. And when they had this done, they enclosed a great multitude of fishes, and their net break. Let's pray. Dame Father, Lord, just speak through me now, Lord. Speak to our hearts so we can hear from heaven. And help us, Lord, to hear what it is that you have for each one of us, Lord. What job you have for us. What responsibility you have for us. And just guide us, Lord, as we listen and we respond. We pray this all in Jesus' wonderful name. Amen and amen. As we look at that title, after meeting the Savior, now what? We look at this passage here. You see Jesus comes along and Peter meets him. Now Peter, if you read the story, what we just read there, he had been fishing all night. He caught no fish. I don't think he's a happy person, do you? I mean, could you picture you going to work and working hard, fishing all night? He's professional, right? And coming home with nothing. So there he is, cleaning the nets, and here comes Jesus. The confrontation is, uh, Jesus wants to speak to the people. He looks at those ships. Hey, there's no coincidence with the Savior. Okay? He looks at those ships that are there, and he turns to Peter, and he says, thrust out your boat. I want you to thrust out that shipping, that ship from the land. Now that day, Peter had a choice to make. Just like you folks, in your life, you have choices you have to make for God. Do I go that way? Do I go that way? You got that fork in the road. And so we've all faced them. Whether you made the right choices, you know, I know, if I know you, but I guarantee God knows, amen? God knows. And so you come to this fork and you had a choice to make. You make a choice. Peter, he had a choice that day to make. Do I thrust out or do I stay over here moping and groping and getting angry because I didn't catch any fish all day, all night? Or do I get up and thrust out the boat? Do you know if Peter that day had not thrust out that boat, you may never have heard of Peter again. Think about your life now. Think about your life and choices you had to make. And because maybe you made the wrong choice, maybe you were like Peter, that's it. What could you have been if you had gone the other direction? What could you have done if you had done differently? Something to think about, isn't it? But let's go ahead and look at this here, the, the confrontation we have, because we praise God that Peter did thrust out. Amen? And so let's pick up that in verse 3 for point number 1, where he says, And he entered into the ships, which was Simon's, and prayed him that he would thrust out, thrust out a little from the land. Thrust out. Now when it comes down to the Christian life, every one of us, when we receive Jesus Christ as our Savior, we're in the church, we are in, should I say, the comfort zone. Okay? You're in your comfort zone. You're not, maybe you've just gotten saved. You, you haven't done anything. There, you're just right there. You're in the church. You're not teaching a Sunday school. You haven't figured out about tithing. You're, you're, you're not going soul winning. You're just attending church. A comfort zone. Okay? Well, when it comes time to thrust out, what it's talking about is leaving that comfort zone. The preacher says, hey, I need volunteers to be teachers. Leave the comfort zone, amen? Say, I'll do it. I'll do it. And what we need, we have to realize is after meeting the Savior, what God wants from us, that thrust out, that thrust out is having 
a willing heart. That's what he wants from you. The first thing that God wants from you after you're saved is to have a willing heart. See, with a willing heart, here we have the Lord. He can now mold you. He can make you. He can direct you. Only after you have a willing heart. Without the willing heart, you're constantly stopping the Lord. Constantly saying no to the Lord. Hey, it's time to leave the comfort zone. It's time to say, Lord, I am willing. I'm willing. See, it's, what, when it comes down to getting involved in the Lord's work, he's not saying, do you have big muscles? No, no. See, God has all the muscles. Amen? It's not a matter, do you have an IQ, a big IQ? Because, see, God is all smart, all wisdom, all everything. Amen? So it's not a matter of you being something. All you have to be is willing. A willing heart. You look at Isaiah, which you don't need to turn there. Isaiah 6, 8, we have Isaiah said, Here am I. Send me. You know what that was? That was a willing heart. See, we have Saul, future Paul. He's, he's on his way to Damascus. He wants to find Christians. He wants to, if necessary, put, the, put them in jail or kill them. That day, on the way to Damascus, he meets Jesus. He meets the Savior. And what was he said to him? What were they happy to do? What was that? That was simply a willing heart. A willing heart. And what God wants from each Christian after you received Christ as Savior, He wants you to have a willing heart. You know what? A willing heart will change your life. You know, here we go. The fork in the road. A willing heart will make sure you're going to take the right direction. An unwilling heart is going to make sure you go the wrong direction. But a willing heart is going to change your life. A willing heart would change the lives of others. Did you know that? A, a willing heart in your life is going to change the life of others. Because see, see, Satan knows when you receive Christ your Savior, Satan knows that he lost you. You're going to heaven. Satan knows he lost you. But Satan also knows if he can keep you in the comfort zone, not getting involved, not doing anything for God, nobody else will go to heaven. Hey, having a willing heart would change the lives of others. and It'll make the devil unhappy. I do not want to please the devil, okay? So the simply, what God wants from you is to have a willing heart. A willing heart. So simple. It's so simple. Christians miss it. And I've been in churches upon churches talking to Christians that have been saved for 40 years and are still in the comfort zone. Explain that one. Preacher, what would you think when I was here last time and all of a sudden, you, you showed me a little baby. Okay? And everybody goes goo-goo over it and all kind of silly things. You know how you act with babies. And here I come back seven years later, and the baby's still the same length, same weight, same dirty diapers. Are we happy now? Okay, how do you think God feels? How does God feel? If you don't grow, how does the Savior feel? I don't think he's pleased, do you? So here we see the first thing, thrust out, have a willing heart. The second thing, verse 4, look at verse 4. It says, Now when he had left speaking, he said unto Simon, Launch out into the deep. Launch out into the deep. 
Now, fishermen, if you're going to catch a big fish, do you stand on the dock to catch that big whale? Do you stand on the beach to catch the big whale, the big fish? Or do you have to go out into deep water? You have to go where the big fish are, don't you? You've got to go into the deep. To serve God, you need to go where God needs you. You need to go where the need is, the deep, the spiritual deep. You need to be willing to say, Lord, I'll do it. I'll go. I remember when they came down as a young Christian, and they, the preacher says to me, Brother Dan, I need you to teach sixth grade boys. And I thought, sixth grade boys? See, I remembered how I was at sixth grade, you know? <laughs> Scary, amen? <laughs> what was he asking? The second thing, launch out in the deep, is take a step of faith. Take the step of faith. Hey, where is that deep for you? I don't know. Where is it God wants, where, he has a job for you? Where is it? I don't know. But I guarantee it's going to take a step of faith. You need to take that step of faith. You need to have a willing heart. And then secondly, you need to say, I'm willing to take that step of faith. How does a person become a missionary? Took a step of faith, Amen. How does a Christian grow? You've got to take a step of faith. Take a step of faith. That's when God starts to bless. Amen? That's when God starts to take that molding and making and directing and putting it into actions as you take the step of faith. And what God wants is a step of faith. Now people will say, well, that's scary. Well, listen. Keep your hand right there for a second and turn over your Bibles to Hebrews 13. See, God takes care of the scaries, amen? Hebrews 13. Hebrews 13. And let's look at verse 5. <clears throat> it says, Let your conversation be well without covetousness, and be content with such things as ye have, for he has said, you ready for this? I will never leave thee, nor forsake thee. Step of faith, the promise comes from the Lord. I will never leave thee, I will never forsake thee. I've had people complain to me, they say, God turn his back on me. And they give example about how somebody died, how they lost money, some kind of catastrophe. Let me, let me tell that person the truth. God didn't turn his back on you. You turn your back on God. See, God says, I'm not going to forsake you. I won't do it. I'm not going to leave you. I'll be there. You take a step of faith, you're going to have God there with you. You say, oh, I won't die, huh? I didn't say that. We're all going to die. We just want to die in the center of God's will. But you know when I talk about this, that God will never leave thee nor forsake thee, verse 6 comes next. Verse 6 follows. And he says, So that ye may boldly say, The Lord is my helper, I will not fear I will not fear what man shall do unto me. I shall not fear. You know one of the greatest things that, that stops somebody from serving God? Fear. Do you know what stops so many Christians from starting to get involved serving God? Fear. Fear that somebody might laugh at them. Somebody might make fun of them. Their relatives might do something they have all kind of fear what it is that's going to st stop them hey you know what Satan knows your weakness 
And he's going to make sure somebody puts that weakness up in front of you. If it just simply takes a little bit of laughter to make fun of you, he's going to make sure somebody laughs at you. Every time I get ready to go soul winning, I have butterflies in my stomach. Okay? I've been saved many years, okay? But I still get butterflies. Hey, Satan knows that childhood fear is still there, so he throws it in front of me every time. But you know, by the second house, it's all gone. Amen? It's all gone. Fear? Maybe you need some fear. Because I've seen so many people quit on the mission field because of something that happens. I've seen people quit a church because of something that happens. Quit reading the Bible because of something that happens. You need fear. I was riding a bus through the mountains. I was on a public bus. And these, we were up there high, we're going around a corner slowly, and these men come out with their guns communists and they stop us and they get on the bus and they point their guns at us and they say you men the males only get off the bus and get in a straight line now I know what's next I read the stories I know what's going to happen I figured I'm going to see Jesus real soon I get in a straight line with all those other men I'm about right in the middle. And he starts, the, the man, the commander, takes his rifle, puts it at the head of that first man. And he starts asking him questions. He said, well, you're afraid? Oh, a little bit. I mean, it's, what a question, amen. He goes to the second one, puts the gun to his head, starts asking him questions. Every so often he grabs the man and says, come over here. And he goes on down. Every once in a while, putting another man over here. And he does the same thing. And he comes to me. He puts the gun to my head. Doesn't say a word. Three hours later. 30 seconds later. It seemed like hours. Hey, with a gun to your head, I guarantee it seems like a lifetime. You know you're going to see Jesus. He just stares at me, doesn't say a word, just keeps on staring at me. And then he finally goes to the next person. Then I start breathing again. The men that were back here, they all got killed. They pointed to us people that were lined up and they said, get on the bus. We got on the bus real quick. Fear. I've seen people quit over less than that. A lot less than that. They laughed at me. Try the gun. Fear. See, Satan knows your weakness. And what it is, he'll put in front of you. Something that's going to make you want to stop serving. Stop being that Sunday school teacher. Stop tithing. Stop getting involved. Fear. Fear. What does God want? He wants you to take the step of faith. Simply step out by faith. Hey, he gave you a promise, didn't he? I'm not going to leave you. I'm not going to forsake you. And at the same time, he said, don't be afraid of humans. The worst they can do is put you in heaven early. True. If he had pulled the trigger... I'd have been before Jesus. Amen. And so when we look at the fact that, you know, the step of faith, oh, it's scary. Now, hey, I wasn't planning on leaving on the next. I didn't get up in the morning and say, I think I'm going to go out and get killed today. But I guarantee the fear was there. Satan made sure it was there. But I had to keep on going on. I couldn't quit. Couldn't quit. Put your hand there in Hebrews. Come back to Luke chapter 5. And let's look at number 3. This is uh, Luke 5 verse 4 again. For the third thing. 
Now when he had left speaking, he said unto Simon, launch out in the deep. And here's the second part of this conversation. And let down your nets for a drought. Here he's telling Peter, I know you fished all night. I know you didn't catch anything. I know your nets are all clean. I want you to take those clean nets and let's go fishing. You think Peter's happy? I think he'd be saying something like, right, sure. He said, let's go catch fish. And let's not just catch some fish, let's catch a drought of fish. Let's catch a lot of fish. Amen. Let's catch fish. Hebrews 11. Let's keep your finger right there in Luke 5. Let's go back over there to Hebrews 11, verse 1. Hebrews 11, verse 1. Familiar verse. It says, Now faith is the substance of things hoped for and the evidence of things not seen. You know, there's going to be times that God's going to ask me to do things. I, I, I can, can't see how it can be done, but hey, God can do it, amen? God is God. He can do it. And so if God's directing me, if God is in charge, I know it can be done. And so what do you call that? It would be like a blind trust. Well, let's see. Here we go. You have to have a willing heart. Amen. You need to take a step of faith. And then thirdly, you need to have complete trust. Complete trust. Dads, you're guilty. I can see it in your eyes. You're just as guilty as me. There you are. A dad. You put your child up there. Little child. And you say to the child, jump! Don't tell me you didn't do that. Okay? I did it. That child, does he have to trust you? Does he have to have complete trust in you? Okay? Okay, now can you picture it spiritually? That same illustration, picture spiritually. Hear God He's looking at you. You have a willing heart, step of faith, and now the Father says to you, jump. He wants you to have complete trust. Complete trust. Do you know, God can handle your family problems better than you can. God can take care of your finances better than you can. God can take care of your future better than you can. All he wants is trust. Complete trust. Complete trust. I don't know. You have problems trusting him? Let's see. He's the creator of the universe. Do you think you can trust him on that part? He only made the universe, amen? Those mountains, those rivers, those oceans. Uh, God did that. Boy, I don't know. Well, let's see, he only saved your soul. Boy, I wonder if you can trust him. He's the Savior. Can you trust him? What's he want from you? Willing heart, take a step of faith. Complete trust. Complete trust. Can you do it? That's what God wants from your life. That's what he wants from your life. But you know what? I said it before. Satan knows your weakness. And he's going to put those weaknesses up. Somebody's going to say something. Somebody's going to do something. Something's going to discourage you, put fear in you, and make you want to quit. Look at verse 5. Consider these three things. Willing heart. Step of faith. Complete trust. Look at verse 5. And Simon answered and said unto him, Master, we have toiled all the night and have taken nothing. <laughs> what is Peter saying to Jesus? He's saying to him, It can't be done. Now, now you wouldn't say that to the preacher. You wouldn't say that to God. You wouldn't point your fingers because you're, you're in your comfort zone. You know, you're coming faithfully. Faithfully. 
Peter didn't say it out loud, but he came close to it. We've toiled all the night. What was he saying? <laughs> We've already tried it. We've already tried it, and it can't be done. You know, as I go around America, I find people that have put white flags up all over America. And they're seeming to think that a revival cannot take place in America. Did you read the stories about revivals in the world? Do you know where they took place? In countries that were in deep sin. To countries that were just really a mess in all kind of political problems and all kind of military problems and the people were just running wild in sin. That's where revivals took place. Huh, let's look at America 2013. Hmm. Any resemblance? Don't give up. Don't give up. So I don't believe it can happen. You and Peter both. White flags are waving, huh? Doesn't think it could be done. Look at that second thing that Peter that uh, Satan puts in the Peter's mind there. Nevertheless, at thy word, I will let down the net. Now, I don't know if you caught what I just said. Jesus said, up there in verse 4, I want to use all your nets that you got clean and throw it out there. Peter said, I don't believe it can be done. But nevertheless, at thy word, I'm going to use one single net. Is that what he said? Peter said, I will let down the net. Just one net. Peter was saying, Jesus, I know you're wrong. But I'm going to humor you. And I'm going to pretend I'm going to fish. Because I know we're going to, not going to catch anything. And so often the preacher says, we need to do this. We need to go soul winning. We need to take up this money for this. We need to, do, we need to build this. And in the back of your mind, you're thinking, Preacher, I know you're wrong. But I'm going to humor you, and I'm going to pretend that I'm getting involved. And a lot of people leave the comfort zone and pretend. You say, Preacher, you are cutting my toes off today. Well, it's what I see in America when I come back. Amen? That's what I see. Now, I go many years and I come back. You, know, you folks see it slowly changes. I see it go from here to here, here to here. I see changes like that because I've been away many years. After you meet the Savior, now what? It's time to have a willing heart. That's where it begins. It's then time to take a step of faith. It's then time to have complete trust. Amen. After you meet the Savior, now what? Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, I pray, Lord, that you should just take this time, this message. Lord, I just pray, Lord, that you should just work in our hearts, Lord, and help us to realize, Lord, that you have something for us to do. Oh, Lord, just guide us, I pray, Lord, to take this. And if somebody here is saying, I don't have that willing heart, help them, Lord, to get that willing heart. Help them take that step of faith. And help them, Lord, to have complete trust. Preacher. stand please heads bowed eyes closed as the music plays if you need to come why don't you come and talk to the Lord as he spoke to you about something come on invitation is open there may be some step of faith that God has spoken to you about